Good morning. Uh, when I was young, I asked myself, what's the most interesting thing in the universe? And my answer was the brain, a human brain. And of course, the human brain defines us as a species. That's what makes us unique, our intelligence. Everything we've ever created, this building, computer, software, you name it, has been the product of a brain. But as far as I know, as far as we know, it's the only thing in the universe that actually knows about the universe as a whole. It's the only thing that actually can ask questions about things that are far in the future, in the past, very large. In fact, it is the creation of knowledge, and without brains, knowledge would not exist. So I set out, to, I figured this is a good thing to study, and I set out in my career, I'm going to have to ask, there we go, thank you, um, to, uh, to, to pursue two goals in my life. The first goal was to work on discovering the operating principles of the neocortex. Now, the neocortex is about 80% of the volume of your brain. It's the part that's smart, intelligent. And I figured, in my lifetime, we should be able to figure out how this thing works. After all, it's just a bunch of cells. How hard can that be? Then we, I said, once we figure this out, we should be able to build machines that work on those principles. And uh, these could be fantastic machines. These are, this is not about building, you know, uh, uh, human-like robots. It's building machines that learn like the brain, and it would be a fantastic tool for humanity. And so these are the two goals I pursued in my career. I did this as a programmer. I did this as a graduate student. I pursued this running a neuroscience institute for a number of years. In my latest company, Nementa, we've been pursuing these goals. Now, over the last few decades, there's been steady and incremental progress in understanding how the neocortex works. But four years ago in our company, we had what I can only call a breakthrough. We figured out something really important. We call that thing the cortical learning algorithm. We, uh, the CLA is the acronym. I'm sorry that's also the uh, contributor license agreement, but I refer to it as, as a cortical learning algorithm. This is a fundamental building block about or a key component of how the neocortex works. We've tested this, we've implemented it in software, we've built it into a product. It's been under heavy uh, testing for the last four years. We know it works really well. I'm going to tell you about it. Um, this year, we took in that source code and we've placed it into an open source project called NewPIC. NewPIC stands for the Dependent Platform for Intelligent Computing. So I'm here to introduce you to the CLA, uh, the Cortical Learning Algorithm, and NewPIC. And I'm, to tell you about the cortical learning algorithm, I have to give you a little neuroscience lesson. It's going to be very short, very fast, pretty dense. So either pay attention or wake up in a couple of minutes. Um, so I'm going to tell you what the neocortex is. I'm going to tell you what it does. I'm going to tell you how it does it. OK, what is the neocortex? Here is a good model of it, this sheet, uh, this uh, dinner napkin. It's about two millimeters thick, very thin. It's a sheet of cells. It's about this size and area in a human, and it's the wrinkly thing on the top of your head. It contains roughly 60 billion neurons in its connections. Those neurons have created everything you've ever done, every keystroke, every word you've ever spoken has come from there, and everything you can tell me about the world, all your knowledge is stored in those connections. That's it. That's what we're trying to figure out. What does it do? Well, the first thing you have to know is it's not a computer. It's a memory system. It stores and recalls patterns. So we're interested in building memory systems. And it takes patterns from your senses. It stores them in a way that it can now build a model of the world and make predictions about the future. Now, the cortex also generates almost all your behavior. And when you behave, when you move in the world, your sensory input changes dramatically. So we say it builds a sensory motor model of the world. That's what it's doing. It's basically saying, given a series of inputs, given a series of motor behaviors, what are the future things that might happen, and which motor behaviors do I play back to make that happen? That's basically what it's doing. Now, how does it do it? It does it, and it's a very strange thing. Surprising, I should say. If you look at the, in the two millimeter thickness of the neocortex, there's a very detailed architecture. And the surprising thing is that detailed architecture exists everywhere. It's the same everywhere. This is true in a human neocortex, a mouse neocortex, a monkey's neocortex. The same microarchitecture exists everywhere. And so when patterns come in, they don't go to everywhere in the neocortex. They only go to some areas, which then project through the white matters to other areas, project through the white matters to other areas. So you have a series of regions that are connected together where information flows in from the senses. As you go up this hierarchy further into the chain of uh, regions, you end up representing higher and higher concepts and thoughts. OK, so now how, if, if the whole thing is building a model of the world, then each region is building a model of the world. And how does it do that? I'm going to show you a picture right here. This is an image of a slice of the neocortex, a two millimeter thickness. And you can see that these layers of cells in there, the same everywhere. It doesn't matter where I look, it's going to look the same. And here's a picture of what that looks like. It's delayed, sorry about that. There are basically four layers of cells. This is a deep, it's going to not get much deeper than this. There's four layers of cells there. And um, one of those, two of those layers are involved in feed forward inference. They recognize patterns, like your, my speech is coming into your head. Those two layers are basically recognizing that pattern, saying what's going on in that. 
Then there's another layer which projects to, to the muscles or the spinal cord or other parts that generate behavior. So everywhere in the neocortex, every section of the neocortex is generating behavior and recognizing patterns coming in. And then the final layer here is one for feedback and uh, attention. Now the basic thing that's going on here is this is going on in a distributed way. This is not one spot. This is a huge sheet of cells, very dense, and it's a distributed memory system. So this gives you a flavor for the kind of problem we're trying to deal with. The basic theory that we have is that each of these layers is representing a type of sequence memory. Most of your memory in the world is sequences. That may seem a little surprising to you, but my speech is a sequence, and you have to recognize it. You have to understand patterns through time. Same as vision and touch. My, when I generate speech, when I'm creating an output, like any motor behavior, it's a very precise mus muscle activation that's going on from these cells as well. So I'm playing back patterns in time. It's all about sequence memory. And that's how we, we learn about the structure of the world. The CLA theory is the following. We have figured out how, how a layer of cells does this. It's pretty cool. It's pretty unusual how it does it. But we figured out how a layer of cells does this. Real neurons and real tissue, how it does it. And what's going on in each of these layers is a variation on a theme. They're all doing a, a form of the same thing. This is the cortical learning algorithm. It's this layer of cells, a distributed sequence memory. So this is what it is. It's, it's, a, it's a, a distributed sequence memory. It learns semantic model. I didn't talk about that, but it builds a semantic model from steaming data. It can infer and predict and, and playback sequences. It is also the core of a commercial product we called Grok. Now, I'm not here to talk about Grok, but Grok takes machine-generated data and does the same thing. We take data from servers and from windmills and from meters, and it basically builds a temporal model of that data and makes predictions from it. And of course, I argue, maybe you can see why, that this is a key building block for machine intelligence. If you can figure out what one layer of these cells do, then you can figure out how to build a cortex, a region of the cortex, you string them together and you make a hierarchy. That's the basic idea. This is a, a key component of the entire thing, and we think we've got it figured out how it works. So what is NUPIC, our open source project? Well, it's what you might expect. It's an open source repository for all the code that we've done for this. And it is, of course, a community of people who are interested in machine intelligence based on cortical modeling. It's been up and running for a few months. We're quite active. There's a lot of cool stuff going on there. Let me tell you why we created this. First of all, we created it because people asked us to, the NUPIC. Um, we put a white paper out there four years ago. There are multiple independent implementations of this algorithm. There's people at uh, universities who want to study it. We've made a lot of progress. So we felt, you know, people asked us for it, we gave it to them. But the founding mission of the Menta was to be a catalyst for machine intelligence. And a catalyst is something that accelerates a reaction that's going to happen anyway, but accelerates it a thousand or ten thousand or a million fold. And that's all we're trying to do. I'm trying to get to the point where we have machines that are intelligent and learning like the neocortex. We're figuring out how we do that. We're making our stuff available, and we'd like to have people participate with us. So if I've piqued your interest, what can you do? We have a technical session in this room today. Matt and Scott are going to show you a code walkthrough. We're going to talk about the project. You can learn a little bit about it. We have a birds of a feather session tonight. I will be there. Our VP of engineering will be there. Some community members will be there as well. You, of course, go to Nementa.org where you find all kinds of information, and there's an email group that's active. And, of course, I want to remind you that we need people. We like to involve people. I'm trying to get more people interested in this stuff. There's new applications for the CLA. People want to apply it to different types of problems than we've applied it to. You can extend it in more of a researchy way towards robotics, language, and vision. And there's a lot of other things, tools and documentation that has to be done. I'm going to leave you with a few final thoughts, two cautionary ones. First of all, this stuff is hard. It is not easy. I'm not going to beat around the bush. There's a steep learning curve. Once you get it, it's elegant, it's simple. You can say, wow, I get that. That's beautiful. But it's not like you've done anything you've done before. Don't expect to come in here and just one day be really productive. There's some concepts here that are a bit foreign, and I didn't get into them today, but it's doable. I think it's about as hard as learning how to use a computer, or design a computer. But it's a steep learning curve. Second cautionary thing, I make this sound so simple. There's a lot we don't know about the neocortex. It's a ton of stuff. But we've also made a lot of progress. I feel it's like we're in 1950 in the computing era. In 1950, we just started building computers. They were just starting to be commercially valuable and interesting. But we still had decades of research to go to where we are today. And that's where we are right now. And finally, this stuff is really important. Um, I can't think of anything more important to work on in my life. That's why I've done this. And I know there's some people in this room who are hopefully going to feel the same way. It's important because we can build amazing tools for humanity. We can build machines that are smarter and faster, never get tired, and help us and make our world better. It's also the only way I think we're actually ever going to really explore the universe, to get out there and actually physically explore the universe, but also help us think about the problems that we structure that we have today as humans. So this is a tool for humanity. I think it's going to be as important as computing, and I hope a few of you are interested in check it out. Thank you very much.